Well, 1994, UFC 3, there was supposed to be the rematch between you and Hoist Gracie. So you go into it, you end up beating uh, Christoph Leninger, and you also beat Felix Mitchell, but Hoist Gracie ends up dropping out of the tournament. That was disappointing because, you know, in the UFC, and especially being bare knuckle and you fight multiple fights, you're going to have injuries. You're going to have things wrong with you. I fought through them every time that I went into a fight. I've always fought through them. You're there unless something's broke, right? And then you can't really compete because you're going to make it worse and ruin your career. But if it's just like being tired or cramping up or, you know, a little here and there, you fight through it, right? You just go. And so I remember I was fighting uh, Felix and I remember twisting my knee and sprained. I remember walking out limping uh, after I had fought him, um, but I was willing to go because it was nothing torn. It was just sore. And I remember being fatigued too, because it was two fights. And so I was, I was waiting and I was, I remember this was revenge for me. And um, because I took hoist lightly the first time, I wasn't going to do it a second time. And so uh, hoist goes into his, his match and I don't understand it to this day. Um, and he's never explained it to me or, or even talked to me about it, but he walks into the ring, into the, into the octagon. One, we have an alternate. That's what they're there for. And throws in the towel. And I kept thinking to myself, why would you do that and not allow an alternate to step in and be able to compete when you know you're not going to fight? That's what they're there for. And the only thought I could come up with was he wanted me to have a disadvantage going into the finals where the other guy would be fresher because he wouldn't have to fight anybody going into the finals. And so when he dropped out, my focus because of that night, remember I was a champion in Japan and I was, I was, I mean, I was beating everybody. I mean, I was on top of the world until I got beat. And so my focus was directly at Hoist. I didn't want anybody else. I didn't care to fight anybody else. So when he dropped out of that tournament, I said, I don't, and, and I believe this 100%, if I don't do that and I go in there and I fight and I win that tournament, I probably don't get the chance to fight Hoist. I probably don't get a chance to do that. But because I stepped out of that tournament and everybody asked why, and I said, because I didn't come here to fight anybody else but Hoist Gracie, that put the spotlight on me and Gracie. I had won both of my fights, so it wasn't like I lost and wanted a fight. I won both of them, and I could have walked through that, and I think anybody and myself knows that would not have been a fight for me, and I know that, but that's not what I was there for. I was there for one reason and one reason only, and that was to fight Hoist Gracie. Okay, and then in 1995, UFC 5, you got to fight Hoist Gracie for the third time, and this time it ends up being just a draw. <laughs> so they say, right? That's the rules. But yes, it was. And, and that was the rules um, because they had put a time limit in. And it was the first time they ever, that was the first time limit ever. Like before it was all fight until somebody loses. And this had nothing to do with hoist, nothing at all. This had to do with the timing of pay-per-view. Uh, the blocks were going longer and they, I guess the fight before that, it went longer than it was supposed to. And, uh, you know, people lost pay-per-view and people were mad. And so, they came in with this thing about being having blocks and where you've got to have so much time. And so they came in and actually announced the time limit. The only problem with that was I'm not sure why they waited to tell me the day before the fight, <laughs> because it was a huge disadvantage for me not knowing that there was a 30 minute time limit, because then I would have been able to train a little bit differently and more explosive uh, because I knew that there was a time limit and I could go harder uh, after him because I knew that 30 minutes, there was a time. It wasn't forever. And if I don't finish him, I'm not going to gas out. And so I trained for a three-hour fight. And I would be in the gym and I would be going with the guy every five minutes, there would be a fresh guy coming in. And I would go for two hours and just get my conditioning up so that when I went in against Hoist, I was not going to gas and I could push him where I wanted him to go, wear him out, and then beat him at his own game. And it was, and that's hard to do because he had 25 years of experience on me. He had, I only had two years in this and he was 25 years with 50 years of his family behind doing exactly what they were doing. Um, and it was a promotion for Gracie Jiu Jitsu, which was intelligent. I mean, in incredibly intelligent for them to do that. 
but I knew what it was, right? And I knew I was at a disadvantage when it came to this style. So I had to go in there and make sure that I was in com- great conditioning and push him past his conditioning. And I did just that. The only problem is they put the time limit in there and I wasn't able to fulfill what my training and what I was doing to go out there to defeat him. But I felt like I showed well enough um, to really put myself uh, as the number one fighter in the world, which I did, which after that fight, I was ranked uh, the number one fighter in the world after that. So, but yeah, so that was another kind of little kink in the Hoist Gracie and Ken Shamrock trilogy. (laughs) Okay. And uh, Dan Severn ended up winning UFC five. So then in UFC six, you got to fight Dan Severn. And uh, before the fight actually happened, there was a bunch of drama during the press conference. Yeah, that was, uh, I, I, I forget her name, but she was managing him. And we go into this press conference, Dan Severn and myself, and I'm, a, I'm pretty vocal, you know, and I like to talk. I like to be able to promote a fight. I like to, you know, keep things excited. And Severn's kind of a, you know, low key kind of guy, right? He says things and he's just direct. Um, and so we were in there and, and of course I was being me. I was promoting the fight and, uh, you know, saying things to, to get attention and kind of get in under his skin a little bit. And um, he's just sitting there, right? And uh, so about 10 minutes into the interview, he gets up and walks out. And I'm like, that was rude. Like, w- what's wrong with him? And 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 I forget his like I forget her name, but his she gets up and walks by and says he's going to destroy you. I mean, she was more aggressive than he was, so it was like at least we got something out of him, right? And I looked up and I said, you know what? I was going to beat him, but now I'm going to hurt him. <laughs> so and he walked out. And later on, I find out it was because he just felt like uh, they weren't giving him the attention. They were always asking me questions. They were talking to me. And I remember telling him, like, dude, it's because, you know, when you when somebody asks you a question, it's a one word answer. It's like there's no content. And so I was the one that was always kind of giving him more kind of building the fight. And Severin was just like straightforward, one answer. And uh, so and I and that's why they were doing it. it wasn't like they were disrespecting him. They were just kind of they were there trying to build a fight just like me. OK, well, the fight ended up happening and uh, you ended up. Uh making him tap out uh, two minutes and 14 seconds in. Yeah, it was, it was, it was kind of disrespectful. I felt I was being disrespected because here I just went in with Hoist and did what I did with Hoist um, and my, my, my career prior to that and things that I had done. Uh, here I was probably at the time, uh, probably the number one ranked fighter in the world. Severin just won, I believe it was two Ultimate Ultimates or maybe it was one at the time. I don't remember. That was one because I fought him after he won the second one. So he comes in and he's listed as the champion and I'm listed as a shoe fighting champion. And I'm like, what happened here? <laughs> so I felt really, really disrespected, not only about the press conference, by how, how people were reacting of like Severin was going to beat me. And I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, I mean, logically, like, okay, what has he got over me? Okay. He's 260 pounds. I'm 220, 215. Okay, so he's bigger than me. He's not faster than me. Uh, I, I don't believe he's stronger than me, but maybe he would just call it even. Um, he can out-wrestle me, but he can't out-submit me. He can't out-strike me, and he can't out cardio me, and he's not faster than me. Somebody tell me what I'm missing here. And so in my head, I'm thinking, he, he can't beat me. Like, what, is he going to wrestle me to a draw? Um, I'm like, I just don't see it. And so I, I went in there pretty determined to finish him. And so, and I had different things that I'd worked on because he was a wrestler. He would shoot in with his head and he did. And I caught him once and he was able to get out of it. And I was like, oh, because I thought that was my chance to finish it fast, catch him off guard because I knew he'd do it. But I didn't think he would do it again. I thought, okay, now I'm going to have to really work. It's going to go deeper into the fight. I'm going to have to put him in positions to be able to beat him. Um, But he did it again. And not only did it again, he pushed me up against the fence and actually gave me a brace. So I could like to stand there and hold it. And uh, I ended up finishing me tapped out. And, uh, but after that fight was over and all that stuff that happened, man, we were good. Okay. So then UFC 7 rolls around. Where you actually got to fight uh, Oleg Taktorov, a.k.a. the Russian Bear, 
a name that's I've been called before as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, this is actually a friend of yours. Uh, he trained at Lions Den as well, and you didn't actually want to hurt him. And ultimately, this ended up in a draw. Yeah, actually, it was it was also a business uh, decision because he was actually under contract with me to fight over in Pancras. Um, and so I knew if I was able to get a leg lock on him, which in training, I worked with him and I knew what I could do. I mean, we, we worked out and I beat him up pretty good, right? Like I did in the fight, but even with submissions. And the thing I knew about him was that he wouldn't tap. And uh, it would either probably break his ankle or his knee, and then he'd be out. And so for me, it was really about going in and just dominating the fight, winning the fight, um, and trying to knock him out. Because I real I knew after a knockout, he could come back a month later and fight. It would be fine. Um, and so as you seen in there, I never went for a submission. I was always about trying to, to put him away with punches. But again, he has a chin. And I think I, I, I probably would have better off tried to submit him because the next morning when he woke up, I, I kid you not, his eyes were swollen shut. Uh, it was bad. And so I didn't realize the, the amount of damage that was happening to him, even though I was the one doing it. I didn't realize how bad it was until that next day. Well, then UFC 8 rolls around. You end up beating uh, Kimo Leopoldo. And then UFC 9 was the rematch with Dan Severn. But before the match actually happened, uh, the city didn't actually want the fight in the city and try to shut down the entire event. So they end up changing the rules right before the match. Yeah, it was chaos because everywhere we were going, uh, we were having problems being able to put fights on because it was a political fight going on every time we went to a city. So they were spending a lot of money trying to keep things right. But me and Severin got there and it was going to be a, another one of those fights. And I, because I had, and Severin too, I found out later on too, Severin had issues too before this fight. So we were both handicapped. And, uh, but I had had a meniscus tear, which is not anything that's detrimental because it's just a tissue in your knee that clicks and catches, but it's painful. It's, 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 it's difficult to shoot without having a lot of pain. So I had that going on and then I had a cracked rib. Um, so my whole point was, was that I was going to, you know, knock Severn out. I felt like I had hands. I have good defense to a takedown. My whole strategy was to go in there and knock him out. So we get to the fight and... Of course, we know there's always something happening of trying to close the thing down, right? But they always win and we, we do the fight. Well, it wasn't but a, a, a two weeks prior to that, they had this fight over in, in, in Canada, just over the bridge. And they did a fight and they were told the same thing, right? No punching. Like, you can't punch. It's like, what? Like, this is not a grappling tournament. This is an MMA. It's like, how do you do this without not punching, you know? And... So, but the guys did it. And so a couple of them got arrested over, over in Canada because they did it anyways. Well, and this was in Canada, not Detroit. So we were good, we thought. So they come to us and they tell us, hey, you guys can't, they're, they're saying that we can't punch unless we wear gloves. <laughs> it's like, okay, that's not happening. Um, and so they said that, uh, you know, you guys could go in there and, you, you know, you guys kind of do what you're going to do. And that if you punch somebody, the referee's going to warn you and he's going to warn you. Oh, he won't disqualify you. He won't take any points. He's just going to keep warning you. And that uh, we are going to fine you and collect the payment <laughs> whenever needed. <laughs> you know, like whenever we decide to. So... A lot of stuff was talked about, and, and they weren't going to do anything. They were going to let you punch. I had a group home for kids. I was teaching kids that they could, from my experience, that you could do whatever you want in life as long as you stay within the rules. And so now I'm being told that we have an organization backing you on breaking the rules, but the actual law itself isn't going to be behind the organization the organization's not going to get arrested. I'm going to get arrested and it's going to be all over and I'll lose my license for having this group home where I'm trying to help at-risk kids. So I had a lot weighing on me and I was like, I, I was going to, I was backing out of the fight. I was going to not fight because first of all, I already knew I had some, some things that were hindering me. 
I was going to do the fight anyways because I felt like I could still win the fight. But when they took away the striking, it literally left me with nothing. Like, I, I, I couldn't roll. I mean, it was too painful. So I thought to myself, I'm not going to fight. Well, then my dad comes to me and said, dude, they, they sold this place out. They're going to re reimburse tickets, you know, and so the whole organization came into my room and they were all telling me, dude, we got, we got to fight. It's like, I mean, basically pressure. So I did the fight. Severin had the same issues. I mean, like he, he had issues going on with him and I, he, he could speak for himself, but he wasn't a hundred percent. And so we went into this fight. We went into this fight, first of all, not being able to do what we want to do fully. And two, we were limited on it in what we can do. Like, for instance, they wouldn't let you punch. But if you do, in the back of our mind, we're going, we're going to go home. <laughs> like, we're going to get out of here. Um, so it was, but that, again, these are things in the end, towards the end of the UFC that Bob Meyerowitz uh, and the UFC were dealing with constantly when we were going to every city. Okay. And that ended up with a loss for you. It was a split decision. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let me, let me, let me, let me talk about it. that was the worst UFC fight in the history. I'm including to this date. <laughs> it's the absolute worst fight by any two individuals in UFC history. Right. You said it was the, the biggest regret of your fighting career. Oh, it was huge because I, you know, I, I should have stood on my, on my, on what I believed in. I should have stood my ground and said, you know, no, I'm not doing it because I, I cheated the fans. They didn't get to see a fight. They got to see two guys out there dancing. 